Um, this is the first dev shop I've been able to attend in person. I'm really excited here to be here and to share with you the awesomeness that Meteor has introduced to my life. So just a little bit about me. I'm a grad student in computer science, and the research focus that I have is to understand and design online systems for crowdsourcing and collaborative problem solving. Uh, so at a high level, I'm going to show you some of the current research I'm doing in designing an online, social, real-time collaborative system. But more importantly, I'm here to show you why Meteor is way more awesome than anything else I could have used to, done th to do this. Um, so I have to start this story about 50 years ago in the 1960s, around the dawn of the computer age. So at the, before this time, social scientists basically studied the world by looking at different things and just thinking about it. Uh, now, that's not really the scientific method. So they basically tried to build these labs and be a little bit more principled about it um, that basically had these rudimentary computers, tape recording devices, and cameras. And they try and study how people organize to do things in these labs. Um, it turns out this wasn't too successful for a number of reasons, but mostly because you can't just take a bunch of people and put them in a room and call that organization and try and study it. And also, the type of data they were collecting back then was really hard to work with. So what basically happened is that this type of research died off for a while. Uh, but if you come forward 50 years or so to now, there's a lot of examples of organization that's happening on the internet. So we have collaborative software systems. There's crowdsourcing that has a lot of people. Um, there's scientific projects that actually use a lot of people to annotate their data and collect it. And then there's types of systems that, that we all use, like Stack Overflow, Wikipedia, and GitHub, which you can actually think of as big, organized systems of people working together. So a natural thing that would happen from these two fields of research is that on one hand, we have social scientists who want to study collective behavior in a detailed way, but it's actually hard for them to find settings to do this. Like, you can't just go to a company, for example, and instrument all the employees. At the same time, people in computer science, such as myself and others, are building collaborative systems that have a lot of people involved in them. And we need principled ways to actually design and study these types of systems. So if you, if you put those two together, that's, that's where my research lies, which is basically to build social real-time web applications um, and do an experimental studies of behavior. So the problem I'm looking at more specifically is crisis mapping. So this is, for example, a crisis map of hurricane uh, sorry, the earthquake that hit Haiti in 2010. So when a natural disaster like this happens, people basically lose a lot of uh, access to information. But there are a few things, such as Twitter reports and SMS messages that get out. So volunteers in other countries that have online access, such as in the United States, will basically get together and create a map of the damage that's caused by this earthquake. Um, this is useful for organizations like the UN to, to respond to uh, th these types of disasters. but uh, in reality, the, the, the standby task force, which is an organization that does much of this crisis mapping, hasn't deployed that to, to very many natural disasters. And this is because this is a really complicated task. It requires a lot of people to basically work with a lot of data at the same time and coordinate to produce this map. And it's a, a huge drain on their volunteers to be able to do this effectively. So there's, there's really value for us in actually figuring out how to do this more efficiently by getting a lot of people. So what this crisis mapping is, it's, it's basically a social system that's computing a problem that's really hard for computers. And that is taking a lot of data uh, about a, a natural disaster and creating a single map with it that's accurate and basically allows us to respond to it. Um, it requires people to actually organize themselves and work together with real-time user interfaces. Um, so if we, can, if we can do that effectively, we, we, we should be able to actually respond better to not just natural disasters in the future, but also man-made disasters, such as a lot of the things that has been happening in the news recently. Um, so let me show you uh, just a demo of what I've been building with Meteor and how I'm studying this. So this is the interface I've built uh, for collaborative crisis mapping. Uh, this, is, this is data from Hurricane Pablo, which hit the Philippines uh, in a, a couple of years ago in 2012. So this is, this is a map that's filled out. And basically, on the left side here, we feed in Twitter events uh, to a group of people working together, uh, Twitter or SMS messages, and ask them to tag them to these events. So they just drag and drop them. And this tagging basically describes what kind of damage this event has caused, um, whether it's flooding, whether it's infrastructure, and also where it is on a map. So they locate all of these on a map. Um, at the same time, this is actually 16 people working together 
so they can actually chat about this and, and ask each other questions and answer and help each other out. So in the chat, for example, people have the ability to kind of like refer to each other by name, talk about the, the, the tweets that are coming in and kind of like ask each other questions. And that's what you see tagged in this chat right here. Um, let me just give you an, uh, an overview of what this actually looks like. So one thing that's really cool about Meteor is we can not only do this app in real time, we can actually use it to kind of watch what happened. So this is, a, this is a replay of what I just showed you, where we basically fed in data. People are filtering it on the left here. And other people are kind of working to tag these into different events and put these on a map. So this is, this is basically allowing us to go back in time and look at what happened during the course of uh, these people working together. And that's really cool because it's, it's, it's allowing us to kind of go back as many times as we want to look at peop what people were actually doing. Um, so as you can see, there's this, this map is kind of appearing, and these, these, these places are getting updated, and there's more things appearing on the map. And this is basically about an hour of work that I'm compressing into a few minutes, so um, done by a group of 16 people, which is pretty effective. Um, another thing we can actually do is analyze the data as soon as we get it uh, using something like D3 when combined with Meteor. So this is actually shows you the raw data from what I, what I just demonstrated, where these are 16 different people, and this is what they did over the course of about an hour. So of course, we can kind of like, we can play with this. We can look at what people were actually doing. Um, there, there are different things, such as some people are doing different kinds of work. They're filtering. They're entering in data. They're also chatting with each other. So we can look at everything that they've done over the course of this time. Um, so let me just compress this to get in, into one timeline. We can also look at how people worked, uh, what, what people were doing during this time. So let me just take, take a look at this over the span of the first 20 minutes or so. So one thing that we can do is we can actually browse this data and look at how, what people were doing that changed over time. Um, and, and basically, what I'm showing you here is a clustering of people by the, the predominant type of thing, the action they were doing and looking at whether that changes as they work through this. Um, so another way you can look at this is, for example, if we look at the people that, um, by how much work they did in the first half, and kind of switch to look at the, the last half, we can see that, just, just for example, most of the people that were contributing a lot in the first half were still doing a lot of work in the second half. And the people that weren't doing so much work also didn't do so much work. So that's something <laughs> that is pretty uh, obvious. but. So these, th this type of analysis basically allows us, use, uh, with the help of Meteor, to kind of look at our data in a lot of different ways, using b both basically not, to conduct, not just to conduct the experiment and study it, but also to look at the data um, in ways that have been really hard to do before. Um, so this is just another uh, visualization of basically all the tweets that were, came out of Typhoon Pablo. Um, and this is a network visualization which basically puts uh, similar damage and similar areas together on this graph. So you can kind of play with this, and, and this is basically a, a representation of what the damage that uh, Typhoon Pablo caused. All right, so let me just show you a few other things. Um, during the course of actually running this study, uh, we've kind of, I hit some of, the, kind of some of the limits with Meteor. It was really interesting. So we actually took 100 people from Amazon Mechanical Turk and asked them to, get, to connect to our app at the same time, and we sorted them into groups of different sizes. Um, this is really cool because there's a lot of data being pushed around, but basically after a few hitches, Meteor handled it just great. And if you tried to write a real-time map with this many people before Meteor, you would have a hard time doing it, even with a huge team. So after Meteor, one person, several months of work, did it pretty much from scratch. So thanks a lot to the huge team of programmers that was helping me with that right here. Um, another thing that's challenging when you design these complicated apps is actually showing people how to use them. So this is something else that Meteor actually makes really easy. I made a package called Meteor Tutorials that basically allows you to programmatically generate a tutorial for your app. So we have a pretty complicated app here that we have to show people all the steps of it. And this basically allows you to specify parts of the DOM that you highlight for each step and automatically make people kind of do certain things. So this is a really effective way to actually teach people about your user interface. And this is not just specific for the type of stuff I'm doing. This is a package that you can use basically on any Meteor app to kind of demonstrate uh, how you would use it. Um, so let me just uh, conclude by saying um, 
there's, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that Meteor has allowed us to do. So when we're, when we're actually doing these studies, we can kind of have multiple groups at once and, and look at them all at once in real time. And if you, if you went back even like a decade or so, this type of research was basically impossible because you need a lot of people with a lot of notepads and then you just have a lot of notepads and what are you gonna do with that? Now we get all the data basically for free uh, as part of our web application and that makes all kinds of things possible that really weren't before. Um, so just a few examples, not, not limited to these, but doing these online studies of people interacting and collaborating together, uh, designing real-time user interfaces that actually allow data to go between lots of people uh, simul uh, in real time, and also building systems that probably would have been really hard to do by yourself before, but now you can basically tackle bigger problems than you could have imagined. So th this app I showed you today, uh, we designed it to kind of study how to do crisis mapping better, but the eventual goal is that we can actually deploy it and, and try to improve this process of in, in, in actual natural disasters. Um, if, you, if, you, if we just kind of like eyeball, uh, do a back of the envelope calculation of, of the, the studies I've done, if you, take, if you want a group of people that are working on this for several days, it costs about $10,000 or so, and that's almost nothing compared to how much is actually spent on disaster response. When you consider that probably the most limiting factor is actually information. Um, and the source code is available. And I just wanted to mention, uh, if, you, if you've been on the Meteor uh, mailing list a bit, you've probably seen some of the packages I wrote and wondered why they're so esoteric. Well, it's because I'm kind of trying to, use, trying to do science with them, but here are just a few of the ones I, I'd like to highlight. You can see them all on my GitHub page. So user status allows you to look at who's online and also whether they're actually looking at your app or not or they're, alt or they're tabbed out or idle. Uh, autocomplete is what I showed you before in the chat room that allows you to basically have a type of head that has both reactivity and use publications and collections to back that. And then tutorials, is a, I think it's a really interesting way to kind of build uh, a way to demonstrate your app and show people uh, the ropes. Uh, so thanks a lot, and I'll, I'll take any questions. All right, do we have questions for Andrew? Go on. Yeah, your uh, user status uh, package. How do you, how do you, how does it work? How do you maintain uh, a list of who's connected or not? Are you writing the model with DDE or are you? Yeah, so. Uh, user status basically, oh, hi. So the, the question was, um, how does user status um, keep track of users that are connected to Meteor? So basically, um, there's a couple of things. When you, out of the box, when you install it, it when earlier in like the lifetime of Meteor, I can't, we, had, we kind of had to do a bunch of things manually, so just track collection. So that's when it was a little bit more useful. Now a lot of that happens automatically, but basically it stores a collection of all the users that are connected by each connection. Um, and it also keeps track, like maintains a field in their user document about whether they're online or not. Another thing that's more interesting is that you can configure it to kind of like basically watch if someone is, is actually doing something in their app. So you can basically have both people, whether people are online or not, but whether they're idle or not. Um, yep. Thanks. Any other questions from the room? Yep. I don't have much experience designing schemas for any real project, but I'm curious how much work, it, like what, when you implemented the, the show me the history of what happened, did you have to think about that from the start or did you have that later on? Yeah, so I think when you're, oh, the question was, if, you, if you're implementing a schema for a project like this, um, do you have to think about it from when you start or, or kind of can you just do it later on? And, and I think uh, my experience with doing research projects like this is you, you do have to think of the data you're collecting and how you're gonna analyze it uh, as you start doing it. Um, because otherwise you may end up in a situation where you've collected the wrong data or you don't know what you're gonna do next. And then, so it, it's good to have some foresight for that. I was wondering specifically about the, the timeline you, you showed us, though. Mm -hmm. Where, like, obviously when something gets deleted, you're not just removing it from the database because you can still see it when you go back and replay. Right, so this is kind of interesting. So what I'm actually doing here is, um, on the Meteor app itself, everything just basically happens. I'm, whenever anyone makes a method call to the server to do anything, I'm actually storing both the action that they, they caused as well as what they like what they did. So in the replay I just showed you, I'm basically playing that back through a bunch of temporary collections and pushing that to the client. So that basically allows you to get this pretty much instantaneous view of 
Like, I, I didn't even have to really change the client UI for that. As long as I set up the publications correctly, then everything just looks the same. I can basically play back time as it happened uh, like several months ago in that instance. Um, so the, the, the cool thing that you might find interesting about that is this package called Partitioner, which is basically an abstraction for dividing a meteor app into a bunch of different worlds um, so that the, the client can be oblivious to the presence of each different world. Any other questions? All right, thanks. Oh, wait, we, have, we do have more questions. You made a wrapper around ShareJS. Can you talk at all about how you used ShareJS for your projects? Uh, you asked about the wrapper around ShareJS and if I could use that to do other projects. So yes, ShareJS was actually something I used as part of this app where it basically gave people the ability to edit documents simultaneously. And that's not something that's part of Meteor because it requires this thing called operational transformation so people can actually type into the same box. Um, it turns out it wasn't used that heavily in our research, but I think the way forward, I think it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, duct tape for now, but the way forward is actually to have some sort of operational transform integrated with Meteor. So the way this works right now is there's actually, you can use Ace or Code Mirror, but it's basically running the whole ShareJS stack inside your Meteor app alongside the regular Meteor stack. And that, that works pretty well, but eventually we'd probably want to have uh, better integration with Meteor itself. Um, so I mean, if you, but the whole point was that you could basically just drop this in and have real-time editable documents. Um, and it, it does its job well for that. Time for a couple more questions, if anyone has questions. If not, that's all right, too. All right, thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs>